I I was probably going to get into this in the episode too, but I just wanted to to say I we've actually met before. It's been a long time. Bro, you uh, look so familiar <laughs> that like I know I met you and I've been thinking like where like uh, where did so, I meet this man? <laughs> so if you remember when you when Candy Hearts did the tour with Seaway, um Driver Friendly and Yes. And I'm st- I can't remember. I I was trying to think of the fourth band all day. I can't. I know they Seaway? rip, and I can't think of who it was. Driver friendly. They're from California. I can picture like the album. Oh, cover, Stick Up Kid. It was Stick Up yeah, Kid. Stick Up Kid. Yeah. <laughs> um. So for the first part of that tour, for the first like three or four days, there was three random guys that came to basically every show uh, to kind of you know we were promoting uh, my friend's band. I was one of those guys. Um, what so was your friend's did, band uh exit emergency this all is so familiar to me <laughs> yeah but uh so <laughs> I'm, I'm super stoked that uh you know our paths are crossing again and we get to to do this with uh your now your current project yeah um, so. that's so awesome so so what i'll do here is i will crack my drink do the little intro bring you in and then uh we'll just kind of see where the night takes us yeah sounds really good all right In three, two, one. Welcome to the Beers of Bands podcast with your host, Michael Torres. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Beers of Bands. Uh, This is an episode I'm really stoked on uh, to, to get to do. Um, my guest tonight is Mario Loveland, uh, better known as Best X. Um, how are you doing? I am jet lagged as fuck. <laughs> I'm like falling asleep in my chair, but I'll be good. I swear. Okay. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great. You know, it's it's Wednesday. I I'm talking with an artist, uh, and I don't have to technically work for the next two days. So, you know, everything's coming up Millhouse. What kind of job do you do? Uh, so I do like basically like data entry at a bank. Um, I work with like commercial loans, just kind of doing all like the maintenance behind the scenes on them. Um, Ew, that's like not... a real corporate job. I know it's crazy. <laughs> uh, I, I became the thing that we all hate to be, but it's pretty chill. I mean, we don't all hate to be that if it pays our bills, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, it, that, is, that is true. I was able I mean, to, the world to is buy tough. a house. So yeah. Yeah, you were able to buy the house. How many people our age can do that? Right. In this economy? <laughs> like, come on. This? I own nothing in this, basically. Oh, maybe those records. Actually, technically, a record label owns those ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, for kind of start out, um, for people that might not be aware of, of you um, in this current iteration or previous iterations, but... I mean, like I said, you're, you're Marielle Loveland. Um, you originally, from what I first encountered from you, uh, you were in a band called Candy Hearts uh, based out of, I mean, I think technically New Jersey, uh, New Jersey, New York. You guys were on yeah. the East Coast, basically. Um, great, you know, uh, like pop punk, punk jams. I actually listened to um, All The Ways You Let Me Down today just to just kind of get back into the groove of everything. And that, I mean, I know it came out in 2014, but it still hits so well like it's still such a great record oh thank you that record is such like a i feel like a time capsule of like and not even just the record like the artwork all of the promotion is such like a 2014 time capsule like it could be in the library of congress to represent like (laughs) the tumblr internet of that time (laughs) right (laughs) um one i mean obviously uh that was the last record that candy hearts put out um and then in I mean, 2017, you came out with your new project uh, where it's basically, I mean, it's just you doing your your singer songwriting, um, less full band, but obviously it still all sounds full in the recordings. Yeah. Um, I mean, you kind of came out with your, the debut EP, um, Ice Cream Antisocial, uh, and then you kind of followed it up by uh, releasing another EP in 2020, you know great timing right before the pan well year of the pandemic but uh oh man uh good uh good at feeling bad which um for anyone that hasn't listened to any candy hearts or any early 
best decks please go do so it all it all is amazing and um i'm just happy that obviously you know it's a it's always a bummer moment when like a project ends but to see that you still are keeping like the dream alive and still going with it um i commend you for doing that yeah i mean i wouldn't say candy hearts have really broke up or anything like uh recently we had like a almost offer to like reunite it was like would you be interested in this if I asked them if they would be interested in in doing it and everyone was like on board for that except for uh the club for motor games <laughs> that's why we're not doing it but um yeah I felt like I needed to kind of get out there and do something a bit different so I mean just to kind of reiterate so technically Candy Hearts isn't fully done we're just gonna say it's on hiatus at some point possibly yeah. in the future i like mean that. every yeah everyone's open to like doing stuff but it's hard because like i'm kind of the only one without like that sort of the the heavy responsibility of adulthood like <laughs> our bassist just had a child uh, our drummer he is like a full-time um pretty high up coffee roaster uh people depend on them and I have like you know I'm a I, like my day job is freelance writing and songwriting so uh no one's really depending on me for that much <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard uh, in, in that regard yeah I mean that that does make sense um well hopefully something one of the days stars align and uh we, we get to see maybe something else come out of that candy hearts wheelhouse yeah but... that would be so great especially because i feel like the oh man the 10 year of all the ways is coming up right and to think that i wrote that more than 10 years i started writing those songs more than 10 years ago i feel like i was such a a child and i had no idea i i remember thinking at the time like i'm a real adult this is real adulthood and it, um, no, I don't think it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy to think that we're getting into the the ten years of all like, especially like obviously you you were you know touring and playing all these songs, but like as me a fan that had them all on my phone, like I would listen to everyone's stuff. It's crazy that we're getting we're hitting these ten year marks of like obviously next year ten years of of all the ways, but uh. Forever Kim Calling just had their 10 year of contender last year. Mm -hmm. um, like everyone's hitting these milestones and it's just like. I think Have Mercy is also coming up or had theirs for one of their albums and they just yeah. reunited and are releasing something new. Yeah, it's crazy to see like all these bands that I tour with, like you never think when you're in it and it's happening, like what it's going to look like for everyone, all of like your, I mean, colleagues, friends associates acquaintances like whatever where we're all gonna be like 10 years later it felt so connected and now it's just like everyone is scattered doing different things and it's just right. really interesting for me to see like uh major league is another one where brian is now doing valister which is like really cool music that is just so underrated <laughs> Yeah, it's it's amazing, and even like, um, like I see it in in my local scene too of just someone, like some people just getting together and starting another project and just like growing and expanding off of like what they've done previously. It's just amazing to see that people, as much as like life gets in the way, like they're still coming back to something that they love and, and they're passionate about. Um, kind of you know going full circle and back in like that's kind of you know you came back out with with Best X in, in 2017, uh, released those two EPs. Um, and now at this point of recording, I mean, we're at the beginning of October, you released the the debut LP, the debut full length uh, for Best X called With a Smile. Um, I mean, full lengths are a big thing. Obviously you released a, a couple with, with Candy Hearts, but now it's, it's, the, it's Best X's time to shine with this full length um can I just interject it is absolutely yeah. wild that it took me 10 years to make another full length and not for a lack of songs like I just never thought 
that it would take me that long to make another full length because when I was in Candy Hearts and, you know, writing was the same process, it would be like every year I would be ready for another full length. And with just how the world is, how much everything costs, um, it just took so freaking long. And it's really annoying. I wish I could have done this 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it, so like, obviously, like you mentioned, like you had, you're able to write those full lengths for Candy Hearts, it took you 10 years for this, but was it always the case of like, you're just cranking things out so much cause you just have it. Like you, it's always just coming to you as you're going. So you have like a back stock of stuff normally compared to like now. Yeah, I feel like, well, you know, there were periods, like there are periods like right now where I have a backlog of some stuff um, that if I really wanted to, I could record and put out, but it's relatively on the side of like not that much stuff, like pretty much always when I had released an album, it was almost a blank slate with like pieces of other things that I could build on when I was ready to write. And I really always had to be like, okay, now it's time to write a new album. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to spend the next three months writing this album. Um, and to an extent, it's still like that. It's just, I didn't have the funds, the help, the people, like I'm, I'm a rubbish engineer. Like I can't record myself um, and assembling a team of people to do that, finding a label, willing to put it out. All of those things took so much time and I feel like at the point where I recorded Ice Cream Any Social, like I had all of these Candy Hearts demos, I'd been shopping them to different labels. Quite frankly, the demos were really bad and the labels were pretty nice about how bad they were, <laughs> um, uh, but they didn't sign us. And then I was like, screw it. I'm just going to put out like whatever. They actually connected me with a producer. They were like, yeah, there's something here, but not the thing. Mm. It's pretty obvious to everyone in the room. <laughs> connected me with a producer who I made ice cream antisocial with. They didn't think it was right for the label, but um, I did eventually find Algo Pop to help me put it out in the UK. I decided, um, I had other labels interested in stuff in the US, but I decided like, oh, I, I just want to put it out myself in the US. Algo Pop can help me in the UK. And then um, from there, I immediately started after, I think we, we did a full US tour, one full US tour. Um, which was really hectic and uh, weird for a band that was kind of new and only had an EP. Actually, we toured before it came out mm. um, to do a full US tour, but I was like, I don't know what to do because all I'd ever done was make an album go on tour, make an album go on tour. So I was like, all right, we'll make an album go on tour. Um, and then right when I came home, I started writing Good at Feeling Bad. I had actually written a full length. I was talking to a bunch of different people, a bunch of different labels, a bunch of different like industry guys, whatever, and asking them, what do I do with good at feeling bad? The first full length. And everyone's like, well, full lengths flop. So you should do an EP. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do two EPs. I'll just split it in half. And then um, I finally finished you know, all the mastering, whatever. Mm -hmm. Vinyl took forever. Vinyl was ready. And then the pandemic happened and we were like, great, we can't really release this. Let's push it out. Um, and then right, we, we released it right after lockdown. And right after lockdown, when we released it, Black Lives Matter started happening. And I'm like, I can't promote this. People are dying. Like, yeah. I I can't promote this. It, it doesn't feel right. And so then we had this album that I loved. I promoted it as much as I felt comfortable with, um, but the world was still weird and no one could tour. So I was like, okay, we can't go on tour. What do I do? And I was just like writing more songs for, um, you know, this thing that was an EP. Um, and then slowly it became a full length, uh, because I decided I don't want to release the EP. I don't like half the songs on it. And that's a lot for something that would only be like five songs. So, 
I took my time and what, like how many years, were four years after the pandemic, three years after releasing Good at Feeling Bad, where theoretically I had a whole EP just ready to pull the trigger on by the time that was released. Um, and we're finally here. 10 years. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, everything that happened around uh, Good at Feeling Bad, it's just so shitty timing uh, to try and do that. But it's also crazy kind of bouncing off what you said as well. Like, you toured, did a full use US tour before your EP had even dropped, um, which, yeah, like, it's normally, you know, you drop it towards the beginning of your tour or, like, somewhere intermittent um that way people actually know what's what's going on so like I did crazy. drop it in the middle but okay. it was still weird because you're like touring half the country on a new project so I was just playing Candy Heart songs and our new mo and mostly our new album that no one had ever heard of just hoping mm -hmm. that the goodwill of Candy Hearts fans would come through and they would like come out and hear these songs they never heard which people were receptive to but at the same time, probably not as excited as they would have been had they actually heard them before they came to the show. Because <laughs> I remember the second half of that tour was way better. The first half, I was pulling my hair out. Like, <laughs> why did I plan this so poorly? Well, you know, thankfully, we're past all that. And now, you know, with a smile is out. Um, for people that haven't checked it out, it's a nice uh, 13 song full length, which means, you know, you still got it. You can still... Uh, write your full lengths and, and get them uh, fully out there and it's it's got a little bit of everything for someone um, you know you talk about kind of heartbreak you talk about um, kind of new love um, you talk about some like uh, I don't know how I want to put it like just terrible times in the world um, and it's like I really enjoyed listening to it I, um, like it's not I, I tend to listen to like a lot of like Midwest emo and like I mean, I can see the mixtapes yeah, you know, behind I mean, you. Yeah. I loved mixtapes so much. R.I.P. Uh, yeah, I I love them. Um, but like that's that's more of like the lane that I listen to. Yeah. So it was really nice to listen to this record as kind of like a something different, like a little refresher, and like let it fully sink in. Like I think I listened to it three or four times today just to you know fully get the full essence of what best X is, is doing with this. this I album. do think that the feelings in Midwest emo, because I grew up listening to those kinds of things. And I, I was so ingrained in that East coast scene. Um, and I know I say Midwest, but so much of it is like Pennsylvania, which I feel like doesn't, you know, the Philly yeah. side of Pennsylvania, <laughs> which I would consider basically New Jersey and not um, so much the Midwest, even though I guess technically it is. Um, that I, I just feel like the emotions on the record and the lyrics are in the same vein as those things, even though the oh, music yeah. doesn't necessarily sound anything like that. Oh, easily. Like if you were to underlay like some twinkly guitar, like yeah. there would be so many guys that would just like lose their shit and like cry along to these songs at the same time. Yeah, I feel like if I was like a, a, a gruffer man yelling um, and, and like shredding at the same time, it would probably be a real hit in those circuits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, like, like, since it does have those feelings and like, that's what I'm used to, like, that's really what I connected with. Because like, the nice thing is, I'm not listening to a guy that's like, kind of screaming into a microphone, where I'm trying to like, piece in what he like, fully what he's saying in his lyrics where obviously, you know, you sing a lot clearer, which makes it a lot easier to listen and understand the lyrics and be like, oh, no, like this, this person was going through some shit. But it's also relatable stuff that like, it tugs at the heartstrings at the same time. Yeah, the thing for me is I love watching, you know, that kind of music live, like, you know, that sort of like law dispute, yelly, really emotional kind of music. I love seeing that live, but it's not really what I come back to when I listen to like a recorded album. Um, so I try and mix like the feelings that I like from that sort of like live environment mm -hmm. in something that I would want to like listen to on a record. 
now with this like leading up to this album coming out obviously like we kind of mentioned um good at feeling bad came out in 2020 um now we're you know fall of 2023 you're gearing up for this release what was it like when you first started like hinting and dropping these first singles of like what kind of like response were you getting um you know it's hard to say because this has been like a long process like i explained and you know i started writing a lot of these songs in lockdown right after like sort of during lockdown when i was preparing to release good at feeling bad and i personally locked myself down for a lot longer than the actual lockdown because I was like really afraid of the virus. My my twin sister was pregnant at the time and I didn't want to endanger her as someone um, or my, you know, my mother who's older. Um, I didn't want to endanger anyone. And so I was really in isolation um, making a lot of this and when I was just starting to think about coming out of that isolation, probably a, like later than everyone else, I think it wasn't even until I got like a booster shot that I was like, okay, let me think about making something. Though I can't remember when the boosters were, maybe it was like after the second shot or something like that. I was like, okay, let me try and start making something that like iodine records reached out to me. I was like, do you want to make a full length? And I was like, oh, I was just didn't even know what to do with myself. Cause I was trying, you know, I had that, that EP that I was like, I kind of want to throw it out and make something new. Um, and they reached out to me as soon as I was thinking about that, it's just like the universe was on the same wavelength. And so I started doing it and we released, um, you know, a couple of years of what, like two years after I wrote it, um, the first single, which was, uh, tell your friends and, I think people liked it. Um, I got a lot of good comments from journalists. Uh, You know, it's a lot quieter than Candy Hearts was. Candy Hearts, I feel like, had a lot of hype at the time, um, being especially one of the few bands with, you know, a woman in it, in that scene. Um, It was a bit easier for me to stand out. I had a lot of backing from people who are really well respected and now I'm kind of going in without backing of well-respected people I mean you know my label is well-respected and stuff like that but they're they're not like um famous people and um like you know the hype of like other pop punk bands being like this is cool like I don't have there's not really like a singer songwriter scene Right. of of people who hype each other up so I'm sort of going into it alone and a little bit blind um just trying to find my people now that it's kind of out do you feel like a little less um I don't know like if pressure is the right word but like because I see what you're saying where you know Candy Hearts you had you were you were more intertwined with with a scene at least where you know with Best X it's it's you doing this and like you said, there's not a singer songwriter scene. I mean, most people, no. when they think of singer songwriter, they think like Taylor Swift or, you know, one of the big pop stars, but there's not, yeah. like, there's not like a, the DIY singer songwriter scene. No, there's like, you know, TikTok stuff, but even that is more hinging on like the mainstream because the second that someone gets popular on TikTok, a major label snaps them up for like, you know, a single deal, not even like album deals, like a single deal. And then like, if the single doesn't do well, they drop them. Like you write half a song, get super famous off half a song and then get this major label money. And they're like, oh shit, how do I, how do I make a sustainable career when I've never done anything before? Like that's the vibe of TikTok, which I understand and relate to as someone who sort of got popularity very quickly um and then had to find the talent or the skills that didn't necessarily not that I didn't have talent as a songwriter but I think as a performer that took a lot of time to develop um so it was quite jarring and now I'm like ready for it and I'm like where are my people Warped Tour had like a built-in scene like you were put on one of those shows or someone in a message board found out around like found out about you and there were hundreds of kids willing to check out absolutely anything 
on those labels on those message boards like and now it's just kind of like maybe some people will find me on TikTok and I'm lucky if they do um so I've been trying that and I I really like TikTok to be honest yeah Yeah, it's it's crazy because like um kind of bouncing off your point like I felt for me when I was like really getting into like the pop punk scene or punk scene and I was like looking for new stuff to listen to I could use I used to like I used to have like a note like on my home screen on my on my computer because I would just go on like YouTube I think I found like Seaway when they put out like their first EP and then just like looked at all like the similar things um related videos and just like went down this rabbit hole of like Major League I think Man Overboard um just like you know all that classic era stuff um but now I feel like everywhere, especially like me doing this podcast, I, I try and have a different band on every week for me to find new people now. Yeah, I have to, I found like this niche of like DIY Twitter and that's where like this weird- like, I love DIY Twitter. Yeah, I love it's DIY amazing. Twitter, but I, I just am not convinced that these, it's not the same. Like, I feel like there was a scene where like 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, I could go to any city in America and it would be the same group of people who would put on a show. And then when they came to where I was, the same group of people would put on their show. And these people found each other. They knew who was interested in their city and the like alternative music and whatever. And it's so much more fractured now. I don't think there's a DIY scene the same way. There definitely are the same people who like, you know, comment on drama and stuff on Twitter, which I love reading. I love chiming in on the most recent one I loved was like, I don't know if you saw it in your feed, but like the tipping of merch people. Yep. Yeah. That one, that one I loved. That one I love. I love when bands are just like, when bands think they're bigger than they are and then get mad that they're like not making money and then become the corporations that they rally against. Like, oh, we're DIY, but we're going to steal tips from our workers. Like, that's just so, I just love it. I just love it. I mean, I don't even know what to say about it. I just love watching it. I love watching them get called out. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes hot takes just should probably stay in, like, your mind. Um, Also, I'd have never met a merch person who's made, like, $30,000 in, like, five weeks. Yeah, Um, that would be insane. Everyone would be quitting their jobs to go do that instead but if that is true which okay maybe it is then that band theoretically should be selling enough t-shirts that it wouldn't matter and if they aren't they need to adjust the pricing of their t-shirts so they make a bigger profit yeah like because they should be selling enough to be profiting if their merch person is making that much it just doesn't make sense to me (laughs) Uh, yeah, that like, I'm one, sorry, that one was you're rough. bad at business. Don't steal <laughs> tips from the people who are working the hardest. Like I've been a band on tour. And to be honest, if I didn't want to, I wouldn't have had to really do shit, sound check and playing. That's not a merch person. A lot of the times the merch people are responsible for driving, especially yeah. on smaller DIY tours. Now this tour, I feel like there was probably a tour manager who was doing it or whatever. I don't know. Um, but also the merch person has to do like they're at the the, loading all the stuff in and counting it all up sitting there all day trying to smile at people who are drunk annoying and messing up your merch trying to have pleasant conversations with people who won't leave you alone that are too drunk to recognize that you can't talk to them because you're working and you're a representative of the band, like those, they deserve tips. And a lot of the times they also lie and finagle the finances to make you more money, to lie about how much stuff you're selling. So the venues who are like taking a cut, don't take the cut that they should. Yeah. Which, well, not really should, because they shouldn't take any cut, but the the cut that they think they deserve. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like that was even warranted to be said by that band uh and why they thought that um i know that they released like this whole like apology like almost notes app shit to kind of oh my god i didn't see the apology yeah they said something on in there about like 
there was confusion because they had like a QR code at their merch table for, for tips. And I guess people were confused and like, so they got rid of it. So if there was a QR code, that means that the tips were, because they were going to steal the tips anyway. Like, well, it was, it was at the tips for the QR code. And this is, if I read it correctly, uh, we're supposed to be going towards like the band and crew. And like, but I guess there must have been a. T- no, that's not the, real. If, yeah, it it didn't make I don't any know. sense to me. I don't know. Like I, we've done really big tours, and I've almost always, except for um, you know, a few tours where we had a friend who's like, "Oh, can I really? I really want to sell merch for you," and I'm like, "Ah, all right, come along." Um, or Warp Tour, where I just knew I couldn't handle it because it was just too much for me to do at that point. Um, I've always sold our merch, and. So that's how I've seen how much merch people work. And it's just so inappropriate to steal tips. I don't think I even asked for tips when I was the merch person because I just didn't think of it because I was really trying hard to promote my band. And um, we only got people once our band became a little bit too popular and people were kind of unwilling to buy from me. Like they were just afraid to come talk to me and like felt awkward. Oh, okay. Um so we did end up selling a bit better with a, a person in those instances. If I was just like there to meet people and then hide. Uh, no, yeah, I, I from their perspective, I could see that. I, there's been a couple times where I think I wanted to get merch from a band and like I see like one of their members there and I'm just like awestruck. So I'm like, uh, do I want to make myself look like a complete fool in front of them or yeah. a random merch person that isn't my idol? That's the thing. Yeah. I, I felt like people were get because like, I would, it's so sweet and so flattering. Like I, I love, like, it's just so sweet. It's the sweetest thing in the whole world, but you know, you feel bad because there's someone who like wants to buy merch and their hands shaking, like Kenny, the, and I, I feel so bad because like, I just, I don't know. And I can't, I feel like I can look intimidating too. So I, I get it kind of like I, I would be nervous too talking to someone who I'm nervous talking to everyone I think is a good artist I'm sometimes nervous talking to my friends because I think they're such good artists then when we talk about art stuff I'm like do they like me am I sure they like me they're my best friends but like I don't know I really want them to think I'm cool <laughs> well uh you're, you're definitely cool I know <laughs> you you were super nice and personable when when uh we ran into each other when you're on that tour with Stick Up Kid and Seaway and Driver Friendly. Um, actually, all of Candy Hearts was like super nice to us three random dudes uh, that follow that tour. So uh, the guys really, are much nicer really than me. <laughs> <laughs> I've read some um, things about myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but kind of jumping back into the record, uh, one cool thing you did for it is leading up to release day, you made like a post for every song and kind of did like this whole little background into like the deeper meaning between each song. Now I'm not going to have you, you know, go through and do a whole track by track uh, with me tonight because anyone that wants to hear those or read those, please go check out uh, the best X Instagram, which we'll talk about links later, but it's, it's really cool that you did that. What was the idea behind, you know, putting it out there in the world prior to, or as it was getting released? Well, I think that there had been such a lull in my creative output, like my public creative output, that I wanted to kind of reel people back in and and get them more excited. And I think the strong point of my band has always been just me being my honest self. Like, I don't necessarily think, like, I, well, I, I know I'm not the best singer. I'm not the best guitar player. The one thing I feel like I have is, is who I am and, you know, me just like reaching out to people being my authentic self, my authentic self and having no fear about fitting into a mold or, or being what people want. Just always, that's, that's one of my core values is always doing like what I think is the right move, what I think is a good thing um, and always being myself. And so 
I really was thinking hard about like, what's a way that I could like sort of put that energy into the world to show people the things that I have been going through and, and hope that maybe they would relate to them before they get a chance to really let it soak in with the album, especially because when you first listen to an album, not everyone is going to be listening to each track individually, extrapolating meaning. Um, that's something that happens like 10, 15 listens down the line. And I think some people might never even get there with an album. You know what I mean? Like, unless mm -hmm. they're a super fan, they might never even get there. So I wanted to just sort of put it out and show the behind the scenes of like how hard I've been working, the stuff that really affected me in the world, in my world, the greater world, um, and hope that people would find meaning in it and relate and get excited to listen to the album. Yeah, I, I mean, bouncing off your point, I, I brought it up on multiple episodes, like the first few listens, you're just you're just soaking in the music itself. Uh, like you said, it does take quite a few listens to fully let the lyrics hit you to understand what's going on. Yeah. I really love that you decided to you know put all that out in the world um, because you know a lot of a lot I feel like a majority of bands they'll put on an album they'll just say hey like these songs mean a lot to us like here's this and then you listen to it and you kind of get a feel for what's going on but it's not, but with you you know releasing like these little um synopsises for each um song it adds a whole deeper meaning because then you fully understand what's going on rather than trying to imagine the things that might have happened or how it relates um so i really liked that you did that yeah thank you storytelling is really like the thing that i have and I'm not like Taylor Swift, where people are going to try really, really hard to extrapolate the meaning that I meant out of the songs. So I have to do it for them. <laughs> and I'm more than happy to. Uh, but yeah, I mean, also bouncing off of that, like your storytelling skills are very apparent throughout this this record. Um, like, uh, hold on, I have I have all the track listings. Up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't want to butcher anything um because no oh, it's I all right be, I butcher I things regularly <laughs> <laughs> um but I feel like uh tell your friends has a really good storyline with that one thank and then, you um but just what you're able to kind of convey in your lyrics to fully paint the full picture um, I was really proud of tell your friends well. in that regard I was definitely really proud of that one especially the line when I thought of the line um uh do you know they signed up to be a single mom to a 30 year old who already has one I was like because I was just joking around like in my room like playing a guitar like guitar I, I wanted to write like a little waltz and something that was like quirky and cute and I was just like messing around and I sang that and to be honest I like I couldn't sing that song for shit I couldn't sing it at all and I I wrote that line and I'm like that's hilarious is it too mean I sent it to my best friend and she was like that you have to write that. That is so <laughs> sick. But I was like, I'll never be able to sing this. The melody doesn't even make sense to me. And I wasn't used to singing that time signature or that like way of like how it moves. And um, I was really worried that it wasn't going to get there. I almost threw it out. And I'm so glad that I didn't because once I got into the studio and I really started working on it, it made perfect sense to me. And it came out to be one of the songs that I just love the most. It's It's such a great, just like, one offline of just like oh shit like like that's like that's like a heated thing that you think about like especially like you know where a lot of these songs are like going through that breakup and like dealing with that like that's definitely like a moment where like oh yeah that's a good like comeback line of like you you hurt me like this is kind of like a retort to it but it's it's done so well and it's just a line that you just don't see coming um, i feel like in a lot of like, you know, growing up listening to pop punk, Midwest emo, there are a lot of songs about like, you know, hating your girlfriend um, for how much she hurt you. And I found that there are not that many songs. I mean, now, now there are more about like hating your boyfriend, but there are not that many songs about like in that genre of like the, the visceral pain of like a man you're dating being an absolute clown and the embarrassment of an absolute clown hurting you so much. And people don't really talk about like that distinction of like, okay, like you hate your girlfriend, you hate the crazy girl that you say is crazy, 
but there's not really in the scene any of that comeback of like well I'm not crazy you're the one who drove me crazy because I had to take care of you because you were a child right um and so I wanted to definitely put that sort of energy out there especially the freedom once someone hurts you so much you lose this respect like you know someone can break up with you but once you lose the respect for them because of how they treated you it's like really done and I wanted to create that image of like thank you for disrespecting me in such a comically horrific way that I no longer give a shit about you or anyone you're associated with. And it's it's definitely a great uh, little like F you song um, for, you know, everyone that's listening. Yeah, Taylor Swift might write some good uh, F you songs, but, you know, Marielle's got, got them right <laughs> up her sleeves too. <laughs> my old manager once turned to uh, my boyfriend years ago uh, and was like, he's like, oh, she's never written a song about me. And she was like, you don't want her to, I assure you. But I, I did actually write write some nice songs about about that that one. I, I didn't write any mean songs about that one. <laughs> okay. I thought I thought you were just gonna be like, I did write some some. Uh, I some did write songs. some songs about him, but no, they were all really nice. He was <laughs> okay. he was a pretty good boyfriend. All right, well that's good. <laughs> Um, one other cool thing, I know you did write a song, uh, Joyride, for this album, um, glad, Joyride, in parentheses, Glad You Found Me, which is, you know, the complete opposite of uh, Tell All Your Friends, where it's, you know, you're just finding kind of like someone new and so happy that you were able to meet that person and and, and connect with them in your life. Um, I'm guessing that one might be someone more recent Yes. Well, first of all, I don't know how the parentheses happened in that song because <laughs> it was never my intention to name it that. And then suddenly it was named glad that you found me. <laughs> and I'm like, how did that happen? It must've been in the file name <laughs> because we like used working titles in the studio and it like just someone just put it somewhere along the way. So, um, that makes sense. so that happened. Um, but yeah, I wrote that song about meeting my husband uh th well i know uh one th like we kind of talked about earlier um this episode has been in the works for uh a little while um you yeah recently got married uh and yes. had all that fun stuff so <laughs> i want to say congratulations for that Thank as well you. um what did he think when you showed him the song the first time he was a bozo i mean <laughs> i think he was flattered but he's such a bashful english man that a song that sweet, I think reacting to it is always like, oh, that's, you know, the lines are so funny. Like and the thing that he pointed out when I first showed him the song, instead of being like, oh, I'm so flattered, I love it, was, oh, well, you know, that line about not having to pay for the parts of a rental car doesn't make any sense because you do. And I'm like, if you really want to get into semantics, sir, if you're renting a car and you don't buy the insurance to prevent you from having to pay for scratches, I feel like you're irresponsible because here in the real adult world, <laughs> we are not responsible for the damage of rental cars because we make sure we're not because we know our driving skills better. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think he, he, he agreed to be in a TikTok uh, of me singing it. So I think that is a stamp of approval. <laughs> yeah i i would say so i know it's t for anyone that's like like you're saying kind of uh shy bashful to get on a tiktok and and do that out in the world like it it takes a lot obviously you know he does love you so that's why he yeah sure he hates doing it. he hates social media i mean aside from <laughs> like you know memes and like sending memes and stuff like actually being on social media for real he is like a real man in the real world and I am uh, like a girl on the internet. So so the fact that he bent to be in, in my thing must mean it's his favorite song in the whole world. He was my top listener the year that we met. Um, or I was his top artist on Spotify. Um, so I think he was really smitten. Well, you know, hopefully, hopefully that number <laughs> stay, that like name stays at the top. Uh, I mean, the album did come out, so hopefully... We're getting close to end of the year, so yeah. If I'm not in his at least top five, there are going to be some <laughs> conversations. Uh, no, but yeah, that's that's awesome that you 
uh, did that song for him. And it's kind of nice too. Like the, the album starts off with like, uh, you know, tell all your friends where it's like an F you to, to a previous relationship. And then by the end, you know, you hit, um, uh, Joyride. I was thinking glad you found me. So I just wanted to make sure I got your title properly right. Ah, uh, it doesn't uh, matter. <laughs> it's everyone's song now. So true. But it's <laughs> nice that you have like that, uh, almost like yin and yang between like the, the start and end of the album. Granted, we do get to um, the end, uh, which is the second and last song, which kind of just talks about like all the fucked up shit going on in the world. Um, yeah. but it's nice to see the difference in at least the um, relationship version of the songs. Yeah, I wanted the album to really focus on all of the different um, pressures that are put on women in society, uh, like the pressure to be pleasant and shrink themselves in a relationship, as well as the pressure to really find a partner and and feel secure. And that's not necessarily a, a like a pressure on women, that's a pressure on everyone. It's really hard to find a partner that you can settle down with and be sure about. It's like one of the hardest things in the world, but I really wanted the album to focus on all of these sort of pressures of womanhood and adulthood. Yeah. And I, I feel like it, it hits very well. Um, obviously that's coming from me with a, you know, a male perspective background uh, from the past 30 years of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I thought it, it portrayed that very well. Hopefully everyone that's listening um, isn't, thinking in my mindset i mean i don't know why i said it that way like I don't know <laughs> mindset but i i did enjoy listening to it I, I love everything you're doing um and i hope everyone else enjoys it as much as i did i really hope they do too i just want people to like just give it a shot just like give yeah. it a listen and maybe you don't like it okay <laughs> but i just want you to listen <laughs> um before we start to transition there is one cool thing that you're doing that's still this year on december 10th you have a show um yes tell, tell me a little bit about that who's playing what's what's all going on for that so we're playing at this venue called heaven can wait in new york city um with our good friends in bonsai trees they're just a fantastic fantastic band and i've known them for years um I really wanted to have a tour to support this record. And at every turn, these shows that I got offered, the tours that I got offered, the things that I'm like, oh, maybe you like, oh, uh, sure, I'll do it. I think, let me get back to you. Then it's like, it falls through or like everything has just, con and I don't know if it's like this new world of, I think I do know actually, because I posted a ranty Facebook thing. Like, am I the only artist? I've never in my life struggled to get a show, especially as someone who has like a booking agent, never in my life have I struggled before I even had music out where I just had like cell phone demos. There were abundant shows of people yeah. willing to book me. And now I've found it's so hard. And my other friends uh, on Facebook and stuff who are all musicians and, and doing the same thing, they said that it's not, it's not me. It's just how it is now after COVID. Which is, it, it's so crazy to think that, because I, I mean, I, granted, I know that during COVID, everyone was like, yo, when when shows come back, we're, we're going to do- But people are going to shows. Yeah, I think yeah, people no, are going yeah. to shows, but I think that because of the cost of everything, people are tighter with their money. Promoters are much more cautious about shows that don't make a sustainable amount before a show breaking even a promoter be like yeah I'll put on a show that breaks even like whatever or I'll put on a show that makes me like a hundred bucks who cares um yeah. but now people are much more cautious especially because there's like a bottleneck of bands wanting to tour that if you can put on a larger band who's going to make you a lot of money in the same space as a band that maybe will maybe won't what are you going to choose yeah that's true um I don't know the most I ever made booking shows I made like 10 bucks so i was able to buy a sandwich uh i always made sure everyone else i mean that's so good vibe yeah it was it was tight um but i i totally understand like now especially with like obviously last time i booked a show was like 2014 so you know yeah it was totally different then yeah totally different um but hopefully you know at some point we get to see best x on the road to to support this this album 
Yeah, um, I'm trying. I'm trying. My agent's trying. Everyone's trying. Uh, but yeah, so this will be basically like the album release show on December 10th um, in in New York City. I think we have another show coming up in in uh, around the same time in Rhode Island. I just don't know the details of it yet, or maybe it'll fall through like everything else. I have no idea, but um, I, I think it'll probably happen. So <laughs> that'll be um, online when I find out more information. Yeah, well, uh, we'll talk links to everything in a little bit, but everyone that's listening, if you're able to go to that New York City show, definitely go. Uh, I'm obviously in Minneapolis, so it's a little bit uh, out of my way. Um, so you all have to go to that show for me. I was going to come rules. to Minneapolis, actually, but it fell through. Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully hopefully it doesn't fall through the next time, and I'll be sure to be there in the front row yeah. so you're pointing <laughs> and singing along with you. Um, so uh, I also want to make sure, you know, we kind of talked about um, some early best decks. Um, we talked about this this album, but is there anything that we didn't touch on that you want the people to know about? About the album? Uh, no. I feel like we talked a lot about it. I mean, I could talk forever about the meaning behind all of my specific songs, but I think that people need to listen and then just ask me on the internet because I can't think of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. Uh, so yeah, everyone, you heard it here. Go listen to this album multiple times. Get those numbers up. Go get, you know, your... If there, to me, there's not like a an equivalent to like, someone walking and getting their steps but just for like listening to an album multiple times yeah which... give me those those third of a well, sense yeah from, from spotify uh, but, but go give me get those, those pennies let's get those fraction of the pennies right <laughs> um but uh you know as we as we start to transition um into the later half of this episode which is always my favorite part um this is kind of where we just talk about some fun stories from your time in music obviously you know I know you toured uh, quite a bit. You did Warp Tour. You um, have just done crazy amount of things that yeah. uh, I'm sure you got some fun stories in your wheelhouse. Uh, as I normally say, they can be anything horrendous or tremendous or any, any adjective in between. I usually like to think about it like think of the stories that you always reminisce about with your friends. Those are usually the best ones that I love to hear. I think the thing I reminisce about the most with my friends is is our first 15 passenger van. And there is no specific story about it other than the fact that this thing, uh, dubbed by William Beckett of the Academy as, as, tr as Trusty Rusty, um, this thing was an absolute beast that worked at least 60 to 70% of the time. <laughs> and there was one tour that we went on. It was the, the one we did with like, we are the in crowd, state champs set it off. And, you know, State Chance, I think, had a new van. Um, we Are the In Crowd had, like, a bus. Our rusted out piece of shit was the only thing that did not break down on that tour. And I don't know what, what was on our side because it was against all odds. That thing, we we're touring in I think it was March and we were like oh well it's like one week across until warm weather so we're not going to bring winter coats because by the time yeah. we get home it'll be May it'll be warm everywhere in the south is warm the only place that's not warm is like Chicago and it was like Ohio Chicago and then warm Colorado and then warmness so right. we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll tough it out for those three days. It's it's really not that bad. We'll just bring the jackets we're wearing at home right now. Because it was like the beginning of March. So it wasn't very cold. We didn't know that like Chicago was significantly colder. I don't know why we didn't think of this. And there was a polar vortex <laughs> when we went there. Poor William Beckett, who's used to touring in buses um, and not pieces of shit that if you drop your phone, it will fall down a hole onto the highway to be lost forever. This man and his contract was contracted to ride in our piece of shit van. Uh, and he was a really good sport about it, actually very grateful and eventually started riding with set it off, um, which I do not blame him because I wish I could have. And um, we were 
so freaking I've never been that cold in my life we were just wrapped in the back in our sleeping bags frozen um and not to mention the entire interior of the van was duct gaff taped all the way around because the uh the lining of like whatever fabric they nailed to the roof like the of headlining, cars yeah. um was coming down spraying a dust of 1990s adhesive oh. on us which i'm sure had cancer in it <laughs> so we had to tape it to stop that from happening and um yeah before warp tour i sold that thing for as much as we bought it for <laughs> which was a thousand dollars Jeez, yeah i remember one time we were we were leaving for a run and it was like maybe beginning of may and we we're like okay we're hitting like south dakota and then we're like heading I think we were heading like west of california on that run and i was like oh yeah i'm not gonna bring a jacket it's, it's beginning of may because i'm dumb and even though i live in the midwest i should know better but we got to like south dakota and it was just like rainy and like super cold the entire time that we were like playing and just driving through and i was like this sucks i brought one pair of pants and my plan was to cut them right away oh man yeah i don't think we i didn't realize that the heating and we knew our van had no air conditioning which in death valley in the summer was just i've never felt that way before um actually until fairly recently um in london where they don't have air conditioning there um in a random heat wave that was like 103 105 degrees whatever um i had not felt that way until i was in death valley inside a car where i'm like dogs die in cars like this just holding a bag of ice that i bought from 7-eleven and sitting there in my bikini as truckers drove by because of course that van had no tint on it. It was just like windows where yeah. you could see everything. So me and my female bandmate are just like in our underwear, holding these bags of ice as truckers are beeping their horns, looking oh inside. My and my, I remember our, our bassist turned to me and goes like, remember when we would read about people dying of exposure in like school when we were learning about history? I think this, is what they were talking about. And I was like, yeah, I think we we found it. I think we found it. This is how they died on the Oregon Trail. Thankfully, 7-Eleven yeah. sells ice. See, uh, that would have been a good idea if like, so when we were coming back from California, our AC went out as like, we had just passed like 29 Palms. Um, and so like, you know, we're getting into the desert and our AC goes out. And we tried to fix it at a place. the The guy was like, "No, like the the line's broken. There's nothing I can do." And we're from Iowa, so we had to still get back to you know halfway across the country. Um, none of us had the thought to like you know get bags of ice to at least try and stay cool. So like we're driving, trying to make sure the van doesn't overheat, but also like try and like have the windows down as much as we can. The windows to, like, down when cool. you're driving it is at least, you know pretty good but it's better if you like spray water on yourself or have ice or something um but yeah the windows down we would and that van too if you rolled the window down that window fell all the way down you couldn't <sighs> there was no half up <laughs> it just went if you didn't hold it the right way it just it just fell into the door oh um <laughs> it was a van of extremes i loved that car so much <laughs> Uh, well, hopefully the van that you replaced it with wasn't as bad. Uh, no, it sucked. I, I hated it. <laughs> it was technically better, but it was like one of those cars where like everything that goes wrong with like that model car went wrong with it. And, and not in a fun way where like, you know, like we're in this together. We're like fixing up this car. It was just like a shit car. I just hated it. I will never buy a Chevy again, but <laughs> a Dodge. That was yeah. good. <laughs> well, I think it was uh, on like that because we followed that tour for like three days. I think it was like the the third or fourth day. I think we were talking to 
um i think ray was playing guitar for <laughs> for candy hearts so i think we were talking to him i love that man so much <laughs> I still I still see him post every once in a while. Like we're still I think connected on Instagram. And I love maybe him. Facebook I was gonna. He was doing a cover show this weekend, um, and I was gonna go, but or yeah, on Friday, but it got canceled, postponed. I love him so much. Um, but we gave him a CD, and I think he was like, "Yeah, we'll try and play it." There's like our CD player is like completely broken or something. Like, and then I think he like held it in his hand, um, like we didn't have a cd player i think or that was the case yeah we had an fm transmitter mm. um because it it was a t it was a tape deck but the tape deck didn't work or it was no i think maybe you're right maybe it was a cd player because if we had a tape deck we would have gotten the not an fm transmitter the uh oh like the the one the that tape, just fits in the tape yeah because we used to have that um but whatever what hmm I can't remember which van had the CD and which one had the tape. No, that one. No, it was a cassette. That was a cassette okay. with the thing. So yeah, we didn't have a CD player. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, um, thankfully we didn't bad. have that many van problems. Yeah. So many people gave us their CDs to listen to and we couldn't listen to any of them. <laughs> they were all sitting in our merch box. And I was like, this would, I mean, and, we, and we're just sitting in a van with nothing to do. We would have. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fair. It's cool. Uh, it happens. Um, so maybe future uh, people just get like QR codes and get you like a little little slip. That way it just takes you right to Spotify. And then you yeah, like messaging right me in. a link. Boom. Ideal. <laughs> I always read my Instagram messages. So if someone messages me on there, I'm definitely going to read it. I mean, that's kind of cool that you take the time to do that. I, I get so caught up in things where I try and I mean, most people that message me on that one are just the bands that I'm already talking to, so it's a little bit different. But it's cool that like you take the time to at least like read it. Uh, and... I always, always did that. I mean, with Facebook, not so much because I would get so many event invites and so many people just messaging me like, "Check out my band, check out my band," and I'm like, I don't know who you are, and I don't have time to like. Or people being like, you know, thinking that I could help them being like, listen to my demo, like, do you know anyone? And I'm like, I don't know anyone. I don't know shit. <laughs> um, but on like Twitter and Instagram, I always, always, and, and Tumblr at the time, um, always took the opportunity to read those messages and things. Couldn't always uh, respond, but. Yeah, I mean, at least it's it's something to at least read it. But I I totally get the the Facebook thing because like we talked about earlier, we're friends on Facebook. But it was also like in the time where you anyone found like a member that was like on a touring band and they had a Facebook. Like, I'm yeah, I'm sure you've gotten like thousands of friend thousands. requests just from that. Thousands. Um, so it's always kind of funny when, especially like in the music community, before DIY Twitter, it was all through Facebook. So you'd be like, oh, like I have a friend on Facebook. Well, really, it's just the guy that like booked a show for us like three years ago or was going to book a show. You Never know what, him, though? People, like... I actually, people, I always tried really hard to be like, when someone friended me to be like, D did I meet this person? Like, are they someone that I, I know at all? And it was it just got so overwhelming because I just got so like, I would get like hundreds of requests, like friend requests a day. And I just couldn't keep up on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't imagine uh, <laughs> how that would have, would have went. Um, I feel bad for, I think I know I have like a, a member from such gold and like just random people, um, which I appreciate them all so much for accepting those friend requests, but yeah. I, I feel so bad for all of them for all of the ones that they would have gotten through the years. <laughs> Um, but you know, Marielle, like this has been a fun conversation. I'm so, like I said, I'm super stoked that we got to kind of reconnect, um, after, you know, at this point, I th think almost like 10 years from when that tour was, um, yeah, it was 2013, I think. Yeah. Uh, like fall, like actually it would have been like, fall? yeah, yeah. I have a photo like, from September ish or. Yeah. I think it was something like yeah. that fall or some, or, or like, or like late summer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause we had just gotten back from like a run and then my, 
like I hadn't gotten another job yet. And my friend was like, do you want to like, we're going to go do this and follow this tour for like four days. You wanna oh, go? That's I was the like, best vibe. I was like, hell yeah. When you haven't gotten a new job yet. And you're just like, I'm totally free. That's how I started, like started touring in Candy Hearts. I lost my job and I was like, ah, fuck it. Let's just go on tour. And then we never for 10 years. <laughs> that's kind of, that's amazing. I wish that would have been like our case, but. I was really lucky. Yeah. Um. But I mean, that's that's a, a good moment. And always to like end these episodes, I always like to end on like a high moment. So between like Candy Hearts or Best X or just, I mean, obviously your your entire music career in general, what would you say is like one of your, your favorite moments that you always think back to of like, hell yeah, like that was amazing. I mean, singing with Weezer was just, exceeded all of the hopes and dreams that I had for my seeing on television with Weezer was just something I never thought would happen to me but it's you know it's the smaller moments I think that that really stand out the most like the moments particularly when you know we were on tour and it was really hard and we were having a bad time and and we like roll up to like a show and there's just like people who sing the words back to us like that those are the best moments yeah uh i mean yeah those yeah those moments are always amazing i completely forgot about the weezer uh <laughs> thing until you you reminded me uh because that is also just super epic that you're able to do that but I mean I hope uh, more cool things happen in my yeah. life but that so far has been the coolest and it's been huh, quite a few years since then and nothing <laughs> has topped that yet I hope you know I hope the Keyword future yet. is right yeah yeah um well I mean keep keep uh keep doing what you're doing um I know I didn't ask this earlier but obviously you know it's it's still new it's still fresh uh, we're not even a full month since the release at the time of this recording but you know, I got to I got to kind of do my job here and just say like, what what's coming next for Best X after this release? Um, live shows. That's the that's the next thing, and I'm working really hard on it. Um, so if anyone watching this wants to see me play, and can help in any way, definitely message me on any of my platforms. But beyond that, you know. I, I've been writing a lot of songs uh, with other artists. Like it's not really my time now, like to write for me because I just came out with this album. Um, but I always post the stuff that I write with other artists on Instagram and TikTok. So those are the things to sort of check out right now. And if someone's wanting to check out that or find Best X music or merch, I know that there's vinyl for this new release. Yes. Uh, where can they find it? So I would say Instagram, we're best X N J for New Jersey. Um, but we also have a website that's bestxnj.com. Um, but I mean, who uses websites for bands anymore? I guess I have it in case someone wants to, who's like a hundred years old, but otherwise I think Instagram is the way to go. It's all the information is, is right there on it. Well, depending on where you found this episode, whether it was uh, Facebook, Instagram, X, uh, Threads, or you watched the YouTube version and got to see. Uh, Definitely Marianne. don't follow me on X because you'll just find me yelling at Republicans and misogynists <laughs> and it will probably really annoy you. Don't follow me on that. <laughs> you already there, so don't don't go to that one. But you uh, found this episode on any of the other platforms. Uh, make sure you check the description, hit those hyperlinks, go follow Best X and Marielle on all of those except for x um <laughs> and just stay up to date with everything that is going on be ready for uh new show dates new music of the future and uh also i i didn't talk about it but you do have two music videos out um, i do yeah for, um to all your friends and then for the end uh definitely go check those out those are on iodine's uh youtube which i'll put links to those in the description as well um i mean other than that like one one last big thank you to Marielle for stopping by. Thank and you. With me. Yeah. Thank you for being patient with my hectic schedule. 
Of course, you know, I, uh, you know, patience, patience is a virtue as people say, and I knew, <laughs> I knew we'd link up at some point and I was totally fine. I mean, you, you got married and you, you were doing your life and I can't be mad at that. I can't be mad at love. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I really do appreciate you taking the time out of uh, your busy schedule to sit down with me and uh, just chat about everything you had going on. Thank you so much. It was really great. Um, well, that's going to do it for this episode. I'll catch everyone on the next one. All right. See ya.